Okay, everybody here. Looks like we are. Mr. Mr. Brockmeyer, uh, you're up, sir. Thank you. Good morning. And may it please the court, Alex Brockmeyer on behalf of Avildar, Phil's and me. I would like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. We're asking that this court reverse and remand for instructions that judgment be entered in favor of my client consistent with the jury's verdict in this case because the trial court erred in entering directed verdict. The trial court entered directed verdict on three grounds. And the first one I would like to talk about this morning is the duty issue. The trial court required Phil's and me to prove the specific duty of care that was owed in this case. And we submit that was error because under this court's decision and Sturgill versus Lucas, the Supreme Court's decisions in McCain and Lamoni's versus Lee County School District, when we're looking at the McCain zone of risk analysis, the factual inquiry is limited and it is limited to simply whether there was a foreseeable risk of harm associated with the conduct that was being engaged in. And here, that conduct was the operation of the forklift by the forklift operator. See, one of the things I have a problem with this case is irrespective of what the duty is, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to find any evidence of a breach of any duty, even a hypothetical duty, because well, um, Mr. Phil's, I mean, basically didn't see anything. I mean, he basically said, I, I think this happened or words to that effect. He didn't actually see mm -hmm. what was being done with that forklift that failed. Uh, I was actually, that was my major concern. I, I don't see what evidence there is of a breach, even assuming some hypothetical duty, you pick it. I don't care. I don't, there's no evidence of a breach that I could tell. Right. So, the, the, well, to hit first on what the duty is, the, the trial court instructed the, the jury that the duty was to exercise care that a reasonably careful person would under like circumstances. So then we say to your question, Judge Morris, well, what's the evidence of the breach? Now, I am not going to run from the fact that Phil Zemi said, and it's true, he had his back turned to that forklift. But we have to remember that the and, and I apologize, my brief inartfully explained this, but if you were to hold up your arms like this, as if you're the forklift, attached to each arm is the seat belt that was suspended between those forks and connected to the forks by that seat belt. And Phil Zemi is working on the axle when this accident occurred, because remember, he had just dismounted it and he was greasing it as instructed by the forklift operator. So, he has the axle in front of him. And because that axle is connected to the forks on the forklift, although his back may be to the forklift, he can still see how high the forks are being lifted because the axle is connected to those forks by the seatbelt. And he testified without objection. And in fact, in response to you polls questions in cross-examination that the forks were lifted two to three feet in the air, that they should have been lifted three to five inches in the air. And because is of that- in, Is there anything in the record to indicate that because they were raised three to five feet, that somehow caused the failure of the forklift? Um, so uh, just a quick correction, Judge Black, the Phil's and me testified the forks should have been lifted three to five inches and they were right. lifted two to three feet. Yeah, so they, they, but based on what? Because that's, that's, your that's, client testified that this is an enormous forklift with tires as high as he is. Mm -hmm. He came on the property. Obviously, we, we accept that the property owner has a duty, just like if you come in my house, I have certain duties. I get that. Mm -hmm. But he was on their property as an independent contractor. So when you're talking about McCain, they don't have a duty to warn him of anything if the forklift is the integral part of his work. It's undisputed that he needed this forklift to do this actual work. And I see the way you agreed and I appreciate your candor. But you also have to agree that the first move with the forklift to put the axle on was done properly. Your client even conceded that. Now, I can't conceive of a seatbelt holding an axle on a forklift in a junkyard. I mean, that sounds like uh, something out of, uh, you know, cable TV, but be that as it may. 
the axle goes on and then there's a dispute about a grease gun and your client forgets the grease gun and then the axle comes off and your client says he lifts it too high. But yet your client says, and I quote, I heard an explosion, the arm broke, and I didn't see what happened. But I came to realize instead of supporting the axle, he lifted it up a bit too much. Well, you're talking about the reasonable, I mean, the, the conduct of a reasonable person. Well, this isn't driving an automobile. This is operating a forklift. Nobody testified about what the proper operation of a forklift is when you're removing the axle. Nobody. So, Your client said he knew about forklifts, but didn't offer a thing. He can, he can give his testimony about it based on experience, but he didn't do it. There's well, no testimony as to what the standard is for well, a forklift operator under those circumstances. Well, the, the standard, Your Honor, is act like a reasonably prudent, careful person would. And yeah, that, but the forks broke. The well, forklift didn't hit point. your client. The forks broke. The guy that set the steering wheel didn't break them. But he and but the jury heard evidence, Your Honor, that they were lifted two to three feet in the air, that they should have been only lifted three to five inches in the air, and that's coming from Phil Zeme. That's his testimony. Well, that's that's the other problem. He, he's not, not been qualified as an expert. I mean, a, a, assuming that that is his position, that's just his lay position. I mean, he could be right, wrong, and there was no expert that's that said I, this is how you do this. That's what I was trying to ask you initially is that it, there's nothing in the record to indicate the proper elevation for the forks. Nobody talks about that. It's speculation to say that because they were raised higher than he thought they should be, that that is the reason the accident occurred. Except for the fact that, as Judge Sleet noted, when the axle was initially mounted, which Phil Zeme said was done in the exact same manner, the forks did not break off. And so our position is, is that the jury can say, hey, look, this was done successfully. It was mounted successfully in this exact same manner initially. The forks did not break off. But then when we go to dismount the axle and Phil's and he said, I did everything the exact same way. And that if everything was done the exact same way, the axle or the fork should not have broken off. But in fact, this time they did break off that the only variable, according to Phil's mate, who is really the only witness to testify with any personal knowledge of what happened, um, said that really leaves the only variable for difference is what the forklift operator did in terms of how he lifted these forks. And again, because we're at a directed verdict stage, and I, and I, I mean, you're going to hear me harp a lot on this standard today because we're at directed verdict. We have to view the evidence in the light most favorable to my client. And the evidence that we heard at trial that was elicited from UPOL in cross-examination was forks were lifted two to three feet in the air. They should have been lifted three to five inches in the air. That the first time this axle was mounted, it was done so successfully. The mounting was done in the exact same manner as it was at least in terms of operations with the axle being connected to the forks as it was when it was removed. But this time the axle fell down because the forks broke. Now, the well, jury but, 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 but he was operating the forklift and he simply lifted it. Okay, I'll just take your, your argument. He lifted it too high, but that's the same forklift that had been holding this axle for God knows how long before it got installed where your client said it was fine. Now your client insisted on standing in between the forks the entire time. Never told us why, never said that's a requirement. Seems pretty dangerous to me. And he stayed there even to pull it off. The forklift lifts the same forklift with the same forks that have been holding this axle for God knows how long and the forks break. Your cause of action is negligent operation. You didn't you didn't sue for negligent maintenance. Mm -hmm. You didn't sue under products liability. These are either one or two pieces of steel that broke. Now, your client obviously agreed that that forklift was capable of holding this axle. And then somehow it broke. Well, and you're saying that he lifted it up too high. Yes, Your Honor. And the reason for that is because, like you just said, 
the axle was successfully lifted the first time around, which rules out, or at least allows the jury to rule out a mechanical issue with the forklift. And that's why we say the jury could say, look, this was done successfully the first time with, as you say, the same forklift, the same forks, the same axle, the same seatbelt. It was mounted. It was successfully mounted. Then we stop. Then we come back and do it, as Phil Zemi said, the exact same way with the only variable being how the forklift operator operated this forklift in terms of how much he was lifting the axle. And the jury having heard that this was done successfully the first time around and that everything was done the exact same way with the exception of how these forks were lifted, could find, viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to Phil me, that the forklift operator lifted the axle too high. Now, Judge Black, I apologize. I wanted to get back to your question about, and it kind of piggybacks on what Judge Morris was asking about, the lack of expert testimony. Um, I don't think it would be required in this case, mainly because of my client's background, which is he's been a mechanic for 33 years. He testified that he knows how you're supposed to operate a forklift based on his prior experience, that he's operated forklifts before, and that he even went to mechanic school in Haiti. And so it, he does have experience to be able to say, this is what you should or shouldn't do in performing this specific task. But he didn't say that, sir. I have to take issue with you. He did not say that he knew he knew how to operate forklifts. He says he has experience with forklifts fixing them. And there was a question during cross-examination by you, Paul, where they said, sir, do you know how to operate a forklift? And he said, I wouldn't be allowed to work on them if I didn't know how to. I guess what I was getting at is, is this. It seems to me that unless someone explains to me why it's more likely that a fork would break holding an axle at say three feet above ground versus one foot above ground or, or half a foot, to me that doesn't seem to make any difference at all from a, just a common sense logical perspective. Either you can hold, either the forks can support the axle or they can't, whether they're supporting them at a foot, two feet, three feet, four feet. Now, if there's somebody can come in and say, no, what happens is when you lift them too high, then that weakens the forks in some way or poses more of a risk or it isn't as efficient. Okay, I'll listen to that, but I, I didn't see any of that. So I don't, it, to me, it just looked like an unforeseeable, an unforeseeable accident that the fork just happened to break. I, I didn't see any negligent act that caused it. Unless, some, like I said, unless somebody can explain to me that no, no, the, the hazard increases significantly once you raise it above three feet as opposed to one foot. Because it, it just doesn't seem to, I can't make logical sense of that. Well, and, and Judge Black, our position is that because the jury heard that this was done successfully the first time around, and that if everything would have been done, as Phil Zemi said, the same as it was the first time around when mounting the axle, that the accident... Um, I mean, the jury can find that the accident would not have happened. Yeah, but for all we know that when, when the axle the first time around was being held, perhaps that weakened the forks or cracked the forks or some way compromised the forks. It, it just doesn't seem to follow that just because you raised it higher, I, I don't see that there's that makes makes much sense. But anyway. Well, and our position would be that, you know, ultimately that's the fact question for the jury to answer. And the jury did have some evidence before it. It may not be the most ideal evidence in terms of having an expert there to explain it, but they did have evidence before them that they could have used to arrive at the conclusion, which they actually did, which is that there was negligence in this case. And so because of that, I mean, we don't have to really guess as to what the jury may or may not have found. I mean, they did find Upol was at fault here. It's just that the trial court took it away after the verdict. And so I would think of it the way I kind of thought about this is in the inverse, right? Which is if we were coming from just a, a verdict of from the trial with no directed verdict issue and asking, you know, is there evidence to support what the jury did? I think in this fact-finding endeavor, based on the testimony provided by Phil Zemi, 
there is some evidence in this record to support the jury's ultimate finding, which then we kind of backtrack it to direct the verdict and say, you know, there was a conflict in the evidence as to what did or did not happen in terms of whether the forklift after operator acted reasonably, which is why directed verdict should have been denied in this case. You're at 15 then, minutes, sir, just so you know. You put your 15. time, use it however you want. Uh, briefly, I will talk about the vicarious <laughs> liability argument, um, and I want to focus on the employment relationship. Um, the jury heard evidence that you pull through junior um, order the forklift operator what to do, which was take the keys to the forklift and assist fills me with mounting the axle. And the forklift operator listened. He didn't disobey. He followed the instructions, which is consistent with what an employee would do. And then when we overlay that on top of the fact that you pull supplied the forklift for this work to be done, the work was done on its premises. It was done in a scope of work, specifically forklift operation, which is something that you pull based on the owner of um, you pulls testimony, Mohammed Zalika said something they train their employees to do as part of their work. Um, that it's that there would be no need for you pull to go out and hire an independent contractor when they have individuals there that are capable of performing this work. And the court in like Roush, Adams, Cantor versus Cochran, or even the McGarrian case has said those sorts of facts support the existence of an employment relationship. And because those facts existed here, there was at least a fact question on the issue of vicarious liability. Um, the other issue was the agency relationship, which we have briefed and we'll stand in our briefing for that. But we would ask this court reverse and remain with instructions that judgment be entered in favor of bills of me consistent with the jury's verdict. Thank you. Okay. You'll have three minutes when you come back. Mr. Tinker. May it please the court. Good morning. Mark Tinker and Teresa Bona on behalf of you pull and save. I'd like to start with what has been the primary theme as far as the expert testimony or lack thereof. Um, but that's one of the critical aspects of this is there was actually a motion in limine prior to trial as the defense's first motion in limine in the record at page 102 was to say Mr. Fisami can't provide any expert testimony. And the judge held a hearing on that and it had order granting it. And he, his quote was he saying that he can't testify about causation. He can testify about what he saw, obviously, but he cannot testify as an expert about what caused these forks to fail. Uh, so he was precluded from providing any of that testimony by motion prior to trial. But even if we were to pretend that didn't happen and we get to trial, he testified twice that he has no idea what happened. So even if he was an expert, if he was providing lay testimony, whichever he was, uh, and this is uh, critical, I think there's, you know, Judge Sleet, you mentioned this, that this was a negligent operation claim. There was no claim for negligent maintenance. And if you look at uh, Mr. Fisame's testimony, even his quotes, and these are direct quotes, uh, this is from the transcript page starting at 374, I don't know what happened. I don't know why it came off. Maybe they didn't grease it like they should be tended properly. The only thing I can tell you is those things came off on 394. I don't know. I'm only thinking either there was a problem with the fork on the forklift or lifted too much weight. That's the first time I've ever seen something like that happen. So even in his testimony, aside from saying, I have no idea, I don't know what happened. He's saying maybe it was a maintenance problem. Maybe they didn't grease it. Maybe they didn't tend it properly. So he's giving a 50-50 chance even there where it's speculation as to what happened if he did see something and if he was qualified to offer the opinion, all of which was not the case. So starting with that, there's as I think it, it began with Judge Morris, I believe it was your question in the beginning, there was no evidence to get to where was their negligence on the part of the operator. From there, actually, this was something that hasn't been talked about yet, there's additional issues in here. The jury instructions that were read at the beginning of the trial and the pleadings, everything, there was not even an admission that there was a second forklift to begin with or that the person driving it was an employee or agent of UPOL. Both of those things were disputed. The jury was told from the beginning, we don't know if there even was this second forklift. And if there was, we don't know who's driving it. Mr. Fisa May testified that there was a second forklift. He testified he saw it there. Who was driving it? He said, I go to this yard every day. I have never seen that person before. He was a young guy. I think he was Spanish, maybe not Spanish. I'm not sure. That was his description of it. 
So there was no evidence to tie whoever this mystery person is to UPO for the vicarious liability to attach. So I, I, think, that, I, I think that you might want to concede or put that argument at, at less of priority because there's testimony that he walks onto property and, and I don't think there's a dispute that he's there to fix something and then somebody who's there who appears to be working there tells him what to do. I think you might have some employee relationship. I don't think you get a DV on that. So let's focus on what he really says. I mean, he's asked on 359, at any point, did you see the forklift you were removing the axle from lift up? I didn't see it. It could have lifted up a centimeter. Then when you get to 393, he says it lifted up a little bit too much. Then it looks like he may have violated the uh, motion in Lemony and tries to give an opinion. Well, it was either too much weight or improper care, neither of which was sued. So, I mean, none of us, I mean, we tried cases and we provided a, presided over trials. None of us really enjoy removing a jury verdict. Um, so tell me that there's no reasonable interpretation of this evidence that would support the plaintiff getting a jury verdict, right? Correct, Your Honor, and that's it. That's part of, you know, I, I think beginning from there, the only witness who did testify as to anything was Mr. Fisa May. They were, to begin the trial, there were the three doctors, uh, two foot surgeons and a podiatrist who testified. There was a one live witness, and then there were uh, some testimony read from Mr. Zalika, who is an employee of UPOL, but I think one of the critical things to note here is that deposition testimony that was read, that was not corporate rep testimony. That was his own individual testimony that was taken. He was not there testifying at that deposition under as a 1.310 B6 witness. So he was not binding you to anything he even said, but even there, uh, his testimony that was read to the jury was that he doesn't even know if there was a second forklift. And so, you know, that wouldn't have helped anyway. But the only thing in the record is Mr. Fisa made his own testimony where he says, I don't know what happened. I think it might've been lifted too far. I think it might've not been tended properly. I don't know. So again, we're into a claim that wasn't pled with a negligent maintenance, a claim that could have been pled with operation if it was lifted too far, if we were to assume he violated the motion in limine and, and gave an opinion as to why that failed. But every single time he said it, it was qualified with, I don't know. I don't know why it came off. So that cannot support a jury verdict. The jury would be speculating as to what happened to say, we don't know, but we think we're going to, you know, essentially what the cases say is there's no, you know, the, the courts won't allow dart board decision-making. That's what this would be is to say, because there was an accident, we have to assume that there was negligence on the part of somebody. So we're going to assume that the negligent option is the one that occurred here, even though it could have been anything. And Mr. Pisa May says, I don't know. And, the, and Judge Fuller did reserve ruling on the initial DV motion, correct? He did, correct. He asked the parties to submit, uh, to provide written submissions, and then he entered his order after that. Thank you. Just want to look over my notes. I don't think I have anything to add other than that um, you know, like I said, this is a it was a weird trial to take a look through because it, you know it's a I'm looking at it thinking that here's a DV for on liability. So I start reading the the transcript, looking for where the liability evidence was, and like I said, you go through doctor after doctor after doctor, finally get to uh, Mr. Pisa May saying I don't know, and then the trial ends, and that was it. And I believe that based upon that, uh, Judge Fuller correctly granted the directed verdict. Does you have any other questions of me? Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Tinker. Mr. Brockmeyer, you have three minutes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to focus on the, the breach issue because I think that's where we're all focused on here today. Record transcript, page 376, during cross-examination. Um, so this is testimony elicited by UPOL. How high were the forks that fell off? How high were they off the ground? And what ultimately comes out is, you know, Phil's and me gives a signal, you know, and he's indicating, and then they say, that's about two to three feet, approximately. Yeah, something like that. So we know how high the forks were. And then he says on record 393, lines 11 through 12, I came to realize that instead of supporting the axle, he lifted it up a little too much. Now, that is at least some evidence that the jury heard that the forks were lifted too much. 
up in the air. And the jury heard that. And they can say that, look, we heard it was done right the first time. It was mounted successfully. That We can look at that evidence and say, okay, this isn't a mechanical issue. It's not a products defect case. But, but if, if a motion in limine is directed toward the plaintiff not giving expert opinions about the proper operation of a forklift and it's granted and your client comes in without any specificity and just says it was two to three feet, but yet in cross-examination, he says a little bit too much, maybe a centimeter, and then goes on to say, well, it's too much weight and improper care. How is he setting the reasonable standard with his vague testimony? How can the jury judge that that indeed is the objective standard that a reasonably careful forklift operator is supposed to do as opposed to something else? Well, that's the evidence they're hearing, Judge. And you mentioned the most- But is it competent? Well, he had, with 33 years of experience, if the UPOL felt that evidence should not have come in when he gave that testimony, one- they should not have elicited it from him in cross-examination, thereby opening the door. And then two, when that testimony about the axle being lifted too high was asked, they should have objected and said, your honor, objection, that violates the motion in limine, preclude the witness from answering that question. That didn't happen. So the evidence is properly before the jury to consider. You know, if there had been a uh, an objection made or something to that effect when the question was asked, then, you know, maybe that evidence could not have been considered by the jury, but you pulled in an object, presumably because they felt like that was outside the scope of that motion to limit or for whatever reason, I don't really know. But what I do know is it was unobjected to testimony that the jury heard from an individual with 33 years of experience who had experience operating forklifts, who went to mechanic school, who said, I wouldn't be allowed to work on this if I didn't know how to operate it. You're at three minutes, sir. Okay. And so from that, we would submit that directed verdict was improperly entered on breach and we would request this court reverse. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you both very much. Have a good day, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next case is Brookdale versus Locastro.